more on acids and bases. Now, acids and bases, um, we're going to look at the history of them. Um, we're going to look at how they came about and or how they got coined terms, acids and bases, because obviously they've been around forever, but um, obviously we've looked at them differently and over time has gone on, we've learned a bit about the chemistry behind how they work. So we're going to look at that and we're going to look at the pH level, pH scale and what that actually means because at the moment you know that it ranges from about 0 to 14. But what does a pH scale actually mean in terms of um, what is in the solution that we have? And we're going to look at calculations involving pH and that takes up a fair chunk of time. So um, we're going to get stuck straight into it now. So firstly, the history of acids and bases. Obviously, um, acids and bases have been around since lemons were invented, um, so they're nothing new. Um, ever since lemons have been on trees, um, people have been making wine out of grapes. Obviously, the grapes and the wine goes off and you get vinegar. So, acids in that term have been around for a long, long time. One of the great stories about acids and bases and the properties of acids and bases is a story of Cleopatra, which is found in the textbook as well. So you can have a read of it there, or you can have a listen to me tell the story. Cleopatra was a um, young pharaoh of Egypt. Um, she was actually known as the last pharaoh of Egypt, ancient Egypt, that is, anyway. Um, she was around in about uh, 50 BC or something like that, right around the time that um, the Roman Empire was around as well, and she chatted to the Roman Empire a fair bit, and she liaised with um, the Egyptians and the Romans quite a lot, and was kind of bringing in a bit of a treaty between the two of them anyway. Anyway, she was Greek by nationality um, and was a pharaoh of Egypt. Anyway, when she was talking to the Romans, Julius Caesar was in power, or Caesar anyway, if you want to call him that, and he had a friend called Mark Antony. Now, Mark Antony was a very, very rich man, and as was Cleopatra, and they used to have a big um, fight over who could throw the most lavishing parties and who could spend the most on a banquet of food. Now, um, they had a bet for something. I can't remember what it was. I think it's in the textbook. You can read that, work out what the bet was for. But um, Cleopatra said that she would have the biggest party ever, or the most expensive party ever. And the way she did this was, um, at that stage, um, there were these things called pearls. There's still things called pearls. And they were made out of calcium carbonate, which is... Um, like the marble chips we use um, in school. Now, she said that pearls back then were really expensive, as they are now, and probably the really very, very prized, very, very expensive things. So she had this dinner party and just served up some like chicken ribs or something like that, or something quite, quite um, cheap. But then at the end of the party, what she did is took a glass of vinegar and dropped a pearl into it. And lo and behold, the pearl um, reacted with the vinegar and dissolved. And thus she had created the most expensive dinner because pearls were the most expensive things in the world. That's the story of Cleopatra and acids and bases. Interesting story, I think, anyway. And it tells you a bit about what acids do and the fact that acids are corrosive. Acids um, are corrosive. Um, they use as solvents, meaning that they can dissolve things quite a lot, quite easily. So they're used for paint strippers and things like that. They use uh, acids. They also have a sour taste, as we know, they're lemon juice. So back in the olden days, before we knew anything about chemistry, we knew that acids had these properties. As time went on, we got to know a bit about um, chemistry. There was people called Lavoisier, and he did a lot of um, work with oxygen with a guy called Priestley. And they came up with the idea that acids and bases involve um, involve the exchange of oxygen and involve the presence of oxygen, at least anyway. And they kind of came up with this theory based upon three acids in particular, based upon um, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and um, phosphoric acid. And because they all have hydrogen, sorry, because they all have oxygen in them, he said that they said that. Um, the acids deal with oxygen. That didn't explain um, hydrochloric acid though, which was just hydrogen and chlorine. So they had to kind of come up with a new idea. And after a while, um, they came up with the idea that acids 
um, don't involve the exchange or the loss and gain of oxygen. That is in fact, is in fact the loss or gain of hydrogen that are acids. And that's kind of what we define acids as in, um, in your chemistry career. Obviously, this has limitations as well, as every model does. Every, every chemical model that comes up has limitations and has the things that it works for and things it doesn't work for. But for all your knowledge, all you need to know is that acids and bases involve the loss or the addition of hydrogen. And that's what we go on. The people that came up with this were called um, Bronsten and Lowry, or Lowry, however you want to pronounce his name. And they came up with the theory and they coined the idea that acids donate hydrogen ions, so they give away or they lose hydrogen ions, and bases, they accept these hydrogen ions, or they take in hydrogen ions. The word uh, um, term hydrogen ion sometimes is re um, replaced with proton, because that's what it actually is. So we can say that acids and bases donate protons, and uh, sorry, acids donate protons, and bases accept protons. And with this, you get the idea of um, things having conjugate acids and conjugate bases. And we've got a few um, examples there that you can look at, and we can look at this. The first example is nitric acid reacting with water. What happens is um, the nitric acid there acts as an acid and it donates the hydrogen to the water, and you end up with H3O+. Now, this is the idea of the ionization of acids, and this is a um, reaction involving the acid. So once the nitric acid has donated the hydrogen, it's left being NO3 negative. So if I'll just highlight that, this is the acid because it's losing the um, hydrogen. After it's lost the hydrogen, it works out to be NO3 negative. And what this is known as is a conjugate base of that acid. And you get a conjugate acid and base pair. So the acid is highlighted and its conjugate base is highlighted as well. So once the acid has lost the hydrogen, it becomes a conjugate base. In this example, the water is acting as a base because it's accepting the proton. And what we have is the base and its conjugate acid. So the H3O plus is the conjugate acid of water. And we'll play around with this idea, um, especially in class as well. I'll go over it in class, but this is just to kind of give you the idea. If you look at the next example down, you've got hydrochloric acid reacting with water. Um, the hydrochloric acid is losing the proton, so it's acting as an acid, and its conjugate base will be the chlorine negative, or the chloride ion. The water there, again, is acting as the base, so its conjugate acid will be the hydronium ion, which is a H3O+. So you have a, the acid and its conjugate base, and you have the base and its conjugate acid. So an acid turns into a conjugate base when it loses a hydrogen. The third example there, we've got water reacting with the carbonate ion. What that's forming is um, the hydroxide ion and the hydrogen carbonate ion. In this third example, you've got the water there that is losing the hydrogen. So in this example, the third example there, because the water is losing the hydrogen, it's acting as the acid, and the hydroxide ion is the conjugate base of water. The carbonate ion, which is a CO3, two negative ion, that's accepting the hydrogen, so therefore it's acting as a base, and its conjugate acid is the hydrogen carbonate ion. I'll go through this again in class, but hopefully you've had a look at this and you'll understand how we can tell if something's acting as an acid because it's losing the um, hydrogen ion and what it, it forms the conjugate base. And if something's acting as a base, it'll accept the hydrogen and it will turn into the conjugate acid. And we'll go through, yeah, that should make sense. Do some questions in the book as well and you can look at that. Moving on. You have some substances which are amphiprotic, and these guys can act as acids or bases. They can either donate hydrogen or they can accept hydrogen. And you have things which are 
polyprotic, which means they're acids that have one, more than one hydrogen, so they can give off more than one proton. Looking at this, we can look at these, just the, um, the what are they called? The formulas here, and we can see which ones fall into these categories. The amphiprotic are probably easiest to recognize as having a negative charge and a hydrogen. Because they have that negative charge, they can accept or um, take in a positive, so therefore they can act as a base. And they, because they have the hydrogen, they can give off that hydrogen, so they can act as that acid. And here, you can see all of those when I highlight them. You can see the hydrogen carbonate ion on the far left has the hydrogen and a negative charge. On the far right, you've got the hydrogen sulfate ion, which has got the H and the negative charge. The hydrogen phosphate ion there next to the hydrogen sulfate ion. It's got a hydrogen and it's got a two negative charge, so this can act as both an acid or a base. Water can do both as well, just because it's special. You just remember that water can either go both ways. The polyprotic ones have more than one hydrogen that can be donated. And these two are highlighted there in yellow, where you've got the sulfate, sorry, the, it's not sulfate, you've got sulfuric acid, which has two hydrogens, so it can donate two hydrogens. You can donate one to form the hydrogen sulfate, which is there, or you can donate the two and just form the sulfate ion. And same with the hydrogen carbonate ion, so the carbonic acid, which is the top right-hand corner. You've got there, not highlighted, is ethanoic acid, or vinegar, or acetic acid, all the same thing. Confusing, yeah? But this is neither polyprotic or amphiprotic because the polyprotic it has to have more hydrogens that it can donate with our um, ethanoic acid the CH3 they're locked in there they can't be donated so when you've got a um, an organic acid with a double OH only one hydrogen can be donated there so please just be wary of that and you should know what an amphiprotic is and a polyprotic um, acid is. Moving on, we've got the difference between strong acids and weak acids. Now this goes with how much they ionize, um, and by ionizing we mean having the hydrogen be donated. Um, we've got two examples here, you've got the one on the left where they're mostly together, um, where the green little hydrogens there are attached to the um, the rest of it, the acid part, and on the right hand side you've got most of them are separated, so you've only got one that is attached. The weak acid in this case is the one on the left, where most of those hydrogens are attached to the rest of the acid. The strong acid is the one on the right, where most of the hydrogens have dissociated from the rest of the acid. This gets confused with concentration, because the one on the left, it has a higher concentration, but it's a weaker acid. So therefore, it's a weak acid. It will have a, um, a more moderate pH. The one on the right is a dilute, strong acid. Okay, so it's a difference between concentrated, concentration, and strong and weak. You gotta remember the differences between those. Strong means it completely dissociates, and weak means it stays together pretty much the whole time. And that's the difference between a hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, like the right ones, and a vinegar, which is the one that stays together. So that's why hydrochloric acid is used to clean tiles, and vinegar is used for salads, because if you put hydrochloric acid on your salad, it would burn your mouth. Anyway, um, we can look at what a a strong concentrated acid will look like if I just add in more there. As we add in the more of the um, strong acid, you can see that they're all dissociated on there, so it's a strong acid. Knowing what's a strong acid and what's a weak acid, it's easiest to learn some of the basic strong acids and just remember that everything else is going to be weak. Things like hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and phosphoric acid, those guys are your strong ones, everything else will be weak. So things like your 
citric acid in lemon juice is a weak acid. Um, ethanoic acid in vinegar is a weak acid. Um, you got to remember those things. Anyway, we'll move on. Oh, sorry, that's just showing you what a weak dilute acid would be as well. So taking on them away, you've got to dilute weak acid. Moving on. Now we get into some calculations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this here and then I'll make a new podcast about calculations in um, acids and bases. Music